The Vampire Testament Written by Steve Gray And narrated by the author The night air had a tinge of moisture to it. Light vapors gracefully whipped about the atmosphere, briefly glistening as rays from the bright, full moon accentuated their forms. The coolness of the evening could be considered tolerable even as it had a slight prickliness to it. Ancient, twisted oak trees writhed a dance of visual torment as their decrepit branches interlocked and fastened with each other high above the ground. Gingery moss swayed and fluttered in the breeze, resembling torn cloth from a girl's dress. Even though the environment was abundant with its serenity, a foreboding threat wandered the grounds. Approaching the locked gates of a nearby forgotten cemetery, the being known to mankind, as well as to all the things in heavens above, as Lucifer stood before them. His cloak and hood slowly swayed in the evening breeze, much like the dance of the moss hanging from the oak trees. He noticed that an oversized padlock bound the gates together. He also noticed that the lock was old, rusty, and was nearly fused to the hook latch that held the gates together and was overgrown with foliage. The lock hadn't been released in ages, centuries maybe. The appearance of the cemetery with its broken and rust-ridden wrought iron posts and spikes, along with the build-up of several veins and arteries of dry-rotted vines, as well as fresh new overgrowth, gave evidence that this resting ground had been undisturbed in forever. This appearance was surely a prelude to how the interior was going to be. This was indeed the one he sought. He knew that. He stared at the padlock for a few seconds, and as he did, the growth which smothered it began to pop and crackle. Small streams of smoke ascended, resembling small, thin serpents as they rose skyward. A reddish glow started to envelop the padlock as the growth, both old and new, was burned away. As the devil's gaze grew more fixed upon the lock, the ancient steel began to liquefy, turning into a viscid lava. It was a slow process as the metallic liquid lazily dripped and ebbed down the sizzling lines of the weeds as well as the bracings of the gate. Once the padlock was completely gone, he simply blew a slight wisp of breath toward the gates, and they flew open with enough force to equal ten men kicking them open. Leaves from the growth, which clutched the gate, showered to the ground in small cyclones as Lucifer slowly treaded inside. His steps were a slow procession among the ankle-high mists which obscured his hooves. Subtle moans and weeping seemed to be audible from within the earth under some of the graves, moans which seemed to explain the fear and agony recognizing the presence of the one who walked the ground above. Now, as this was obviously an unkempt, deserted resting place, the overgrowth was so thick as to hide nearly every headstone which stood low to the ground. Lucifer's gaze surveyed the area in search of one grave, one soul, his best advocate and servant. It had been an eternity, it seems, since he had heard his prayers, but then Lucifer had become consumed. The apocalyptic prophecies were rapidly approaching, and the war plan was his all-consuming passion. His guilt for not hearing his servant's prayers and praises, however, was minimal after all. He is the author of cruelty and the father of anger. Still, when news met his ear regarding the tragedy that happened to him, a silent rage blistered within his blackened heart, a rage that was directed toward both the Almighty as well as to the people who were responsible for it. How could this patent failure have happened, he thought. He still recalls the night that he received the news. It was storming in the place where he was meditating, the place was as somber and as darkened as his own heart. It was a disgusting, slimy alleyway in the seediest section of a godless city. In fact, the only amulet that may have echoed a memory of a holy god was a broken, chipped stone cross which perched high above an abandoned storefront that was used at one time by a congregation as a church. Its dead silhouette shone black against the lightning skies, which strobed periodically during the storm. 
Bodies of the drunken and drugged littered the alley among piles of trash and filth. Drums blazed with fires that were used by vagrants to keep warm. This was the perfect place, complete with its pain and anguish. Here he could concentrate and feed upon the feast of hopelessness and negativity. A demon approached him to relay the news of his servant. He informed the devil that he had been cruelly slain by knights of the Almighty, and then his corpse was defiled in accordance with Christian rites of vampiric purging. Two members of the order had destroyed his servant in the most humiliating fashion. The slaughter had been calculated, planned with extreme surgical care, and according to the ritual, could never again be undone. The demon relayed the grisly details of his servant's destruction. Once they killed him by placing him in front of the court's riflemen, the two members of the order took his coffin to the tomb. The priest initiated the ritual. He rammed a nearly petrified wooden stake into his servant's chest and smashed his heart. The putrid blood oozed in splashes as the priest's hammer struck the head of the stake. A foul stench filled the tomb, a dead stink, a coppery smell mixed with rot that was immeasurable in its rancidness. The priest then wrenched the head from the body. He stuffed the mouth with garlic bulbs. He placed so much in the mouth that a few of the bulbs that were covered with blood began to fall from the open throat, dropping to the floor. The priest's accomplice placed the hands above the body to hang over the brim of the casket. He crossed himself with one swift stroke. He cut the hands from the wrists, and they fell to the earthen floor of the tomb. The scene was gruesome, and the two involved were extremely challenged to stay the course of what they believed needed to be done in holy honor. They gasped the foul air and held it within their sore lungs as they completed their mission. They turned the blood-drenched torso to face downward inside the musty casket, took the head, and placed it at the feet. Then they stuffed the severed hands under each armpit. This was to ensure that, despite any effort made by the vampire to reanimate, it would be impossible. They closed the coffin and took heavy chains, which they brought with them, and tightly chained it up. They loaded it onto a carriage and took it to the most remote, unknown cemetery to bury it, and forget it, and there it had remained for years. Lucifer recalled his anger that night as he slowly walked among the stones. As he did, weeds and dried growth shriveled and smoked as he waved his hands over them. After a short while, he eventually found what he had come for, his servant's burial. He knew this because of the disgusting psychic aura that was billowing from the ground where he lay. He knew it was him. He took a few steps toward it and spoke one simple command. Rise. The ground began to shake violently and separate. The contour appearing to be the top of a coffin broke the ground. It was covered with layers of mud and rusted heavy chains. Once the coffin made final ascension and rested above the ground, the devil ripped the chains from it and tore the lid from its frame. The corpse inside was mutilated and mummified. It was only dimly lit by the blue luminescence of the moon. He grabbed the torso by the collar and sat it upright. The skeletal hands which had been shoved into the armpits fell to its side. He picked up the head, which was fused with rot to the feet, and scraped the shriveled garlic bulbs out of his mouth with his clawed finger. He then placed it atop of the shoulders. He took the hands that were at the corpse's side and placed them back on the wrists. As the mortifying corpse sat upright in the coffin, the devil spoke. Become. In a matter of moments, the corpse, which had been in pieces and rotting, was now complete and burned with new life. Oh, master, the corpse said, oh, how I have been wronged. The devil nodded in acknowledgment. The people of the religious order interpreted my service unto you as vampirism. I know that I have failed you. The corpse rose its hands to its face. I know that's why you are here, to punish me, it said. On the contrary, the devil replied. I've come to give you the opportunity to damn those who have damned you. He continued. Now, 
surely this hypocritical religious order has spawned further generations and descendants the corpse slowly raised its gaze to look at lucifer i have given you a second life as well as the discerning to hunt them down lucifer said what's been done to you was foul and this will be the chance you need to have your revenge i will say this the devil continued i will no longer be involved in your matters because i have my own troubles to tend to the gift i have given you i'm positive that you will not misuse it master as you know i only lived to serve you the corpse said my gratitude is endless that i will have my vengeance for they wronged me twice because you know i was not a vampire the devil's face melted into a sinister frightening grin you are now he said and he slowly turned to exit the cemetery <laughs>